Hello, E Vegas. You guys ready to have a seat and talk about some spaceships? All right, good stuff. It's a little bit better this time around. So hello everyone, and welcome to the EVE Online keynote. Welcome also to everyone on stream. We hope you guys are gonna have an awesome time watching the broadcast over the course of the next three days. Whether you're here or at home, thanks for joining us, and thanks for making this, again, the biggest EVE Vegas ever. We've got more developers here this year than ever before, and we've got some super cool stuff to show you. We like to hear what you think of what's coming up for EVE Online, so don't hesitate to come and talk to us, engage with us, let us know how you feel about things. That's what we're here for. And for you guys at home, be sure to shout out in Twitch chat and let us know what you think. 2017 has been a pretty crazy year for CCP. We've learned a lot about both what you guys love and yeah, maybe a little bit about what you guys don't like too. It's been, uh, it's been an interesting one. Before we get into the serious business though, let's kill the lights and take a short trip down memory lane and look over what's happened since the last time we were here in Sin City. So yeah, it looks like we've been pretty busy the last year or so. It's been good. One thing's really stood out though, and that's Project Discovery. So I wanna talk a little bit more now about what you guys have achieved over the course of the last few months. Project Discovery's search for exoplanets went live with this year's July release, which was deployed on July 11th. Turns out, you guys really like science and space. <laughs> Who would have thought, huh? Since then, we've watched capsuleers across New Eden chew through data and submit classifications at an unbelievable pace. It's been insane. So far, around 85,000 capsuleers have taken part in the search for exoplanets. And between you, you have submitted more than 38.8 million classifications. So let's put this into perspective. For reference, when you guys were assisting with mapping the Human Protein Atlas in the first iteration of Project Discovery, the total number of classifications submitted in the whole project was 30 million. So the community has managed to top that number with the search for exoplanets by the end of August, after two months of the project. So a big round of applause, guys. The response to this project has been phenomenal, and we'd really like to say a huge thanks to Massively Multiplayer Online Science, the University of Geneva, Reykjavik University, Professor Michel Mayer, and of course, all of you guys for participating in Citizen Science and making Project Discovery the huge success that it is. This has been an amazing collaboration that's come together to allow pilots at EVE Online to get involved in real life deep space exploration, which is kind of cool. We couldn't be happier with the results so far. As we've seen both here in the opening ceremony, Project Discovery is just one of a few amazing things that our community has been up to over the course of the last year. Now it's time to look forward to what's coming up for the rest of 2017. The first order of the day is to take a look at this. EVE Online Lifeblood, the winter expansion. It's 
been a while in the making, six to eight months or so, but Lifeblood ships to you guys in a little over two weeks from now, about, yeah, yeah, about two weeks. For those of you who want to pimp out your desktop, by the way, with, this has become my favorite all-time piece of expansion key art that we've done. I really like it. And if you want to get a hold of this, it'll be available after Vegas in all regular wallpaper sizes as well. So if you want to make your, uh, want to make your rig look good with it, then it's going to be all right. Along with good looking artwork though, there's a whole host of new features and quality of life improvements coming with Lifeblood. Before we dive into some of the other details though, let's take a look at what's going on right in this image. The Upwell Consortium have been super busy perfecting the latest designs for refineries. And these things are gonna revolutionize the way that you guys, capsuleers, harvest resources from moons across New Eden. Let's talk more about the latest offerings from Upwell that are coming with Lifeblood. And to do just that, give a round of applause for CCP Nagwell. <laughs> Hello. So, Moo Mining. FanFest this year, we announced the changes in Moo Mining. Six months of development later, we are happy to say that they are ready to the release in Lifeblood. So, quick recap. Uh, Moongoo is a very important resource in EVE. It's the cornerstone of Tech 2 item production. It's a reliable source of income for many corps and alliances, and it's about to get really messy. <laughs> so, you carve the moon, you pull the chunk, you fracture it into the minefield, come on, really? And then you mine it. That's it. It starts with the moon, fill the valuable moon materials. Each moon has one beacon and one beacon only. It's very close to the moon's surface and far from any other structural station. Around this beacon, one refinery and one refinery only can be deployed. Only from this position, you can mine the resources from that moon. Of course, you can contest the control of any given moon by destroying the existing refinery and placing your own. The extraction process can take any time between one and eight weeks, and you control the precise moment of the harvest. This allows for frequent, smaller mining events or larger ones for many more ships. One interesting thing about exogeology is that the concentration of the moon's materials is not evenly distributed. Once in a while, a richer vein may be drilled, providing high-grade moon ore, a much better source of moon materials. You can see the jackpot ore in the bottom row. They provide double the yield of regular moon ore, but their presence cannot be controlled or predicted before the actual fracture of the moon chunk. That looks like this. So from both these explosions, the same volume of ore will be created. The difference is the quality. The one on the right will give the super valuable jackpot ore. So mining these will also be like a group effort. Refineries that run moon drill <laughs> will automatically store a ledger from the moon asteroid field containing everybody who mined that thing, what ore they did, and it's going to be available for the owner of the refinery. Yeah, Eve. <laughs> so, on a personal level also, every character will now have available a mining history showing everything they mine anywhere in the universe that looks like this. This is for personal ledger. It's completely independent from the refinery and will be available for every character in the game retroactive to July 2017. No APIs question, please, structure. For the moon materials to become manufacturing components, they have to go through reactions, a mystic and esoteric process. This also has changed, and we use the industry mechanics and interface just like research and manufacturing. Reactions like moon drills are exclusive to refineries. Full details on the moon mining process, the refineries, modules, rigs, 
and API. We'll be presenting the structure presentation tomorrow. So with all this new increased activity around moons, the decision was made to go all in and reshuffle all the moon resources. Since everything in EVE is done by players anyway, like this screenshot, we decided to let you guys choose the seed used for the random distribution algorithm. I'd like to inv invite CCP Fozzy now. Hello, Vegas. So, we put out a call to all of you a couple weeks ago asking for ideas of what the seeding text should be for this random distribution algorithm for our new moon distribution. And we received hundreds of proposals in the forums and we've taken the uh, team working on the feature and the community department and come up with a final five shortlist. You guys are all gonna have an opportunity here at Vegas to vote on which of these final five actually becomes the new seed for moon distribution and affects tranquility for uh, a long time to come. So the first of the items of the shortlist text is uh, this modified quote from uh, Frank Herbert's Dune. Very appropriate. The goo must flow, he who controls the goo controls the cluster. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Suggest by Jeff North, it's a Carl Sagan quote. And of course, uh, no open request for ideas for naming something would be complete without Mooney McMoonface. <laughs> so of course, that will be one of the options you guys can vote for. So this is the list of all the humans who have walked on the moon uh, up to today. And then the, the fifth option is this very well-known poem, the Eyes Forward Capsuleer poem, written by uh, Drenchella, a poem for fallen Eve players. And uh, for all of these, you guys are all gonna have an opportunity to vote on which one you want to become the new seed. And the way that voting's gonna work is all of you should either be very soon or may have already received an email to the account that you use to register and buy your tickets for Vegas. There's one link sent per email account. You're welcome to pass that link along to someone else or trade it for beer or something if you want. But there's only going to be one vote per link. And uh, you'll all get a chance to vote. And we will close the voting at noon on Sunday here at Pacific Time and uh, announce which uh, of these options has been selected by all of you at the closing ceremonies on Sunday. And that's it for me. So we've talked a bit about all of the amazing uh, structure work coming in uh, the lifeblood expansion with refineries and moon mining reactions. Um, but I think we can also talk a little bit today about uh, some of what's coming next. What do you guys think about that? Talk a little bit about the future of upwell structures. So we've, we've brought up a number of different uh, long-term roadmaps to you guys over the years at FanFest in Vegas. Talked a bit about what we had planned after the launch of refineries uh, at last FanFest. And uh, I'm happy today to be able to talk a little bit about how some of those plans have changed and uh, some of the uh, new stuff that you guys don't know about yet that's going to be coming uh, early next year. So I want to give a special thanks to everyone who's been providing feedback on all of the Upwell structures ever since we released them a year and a half ago. Whether it's through the forums, through events like Vegas or FanFest where you come and talk to us at the bars, uh, through the CSM passing along uh, ideas and suggestions to them and voting, uh, or through blogs and podcasts that we listen to. You guys have been amazing in providing us your feedback. And uh, we have taken a lot of that into account with the changes to our plans. So I'm going to talk today about something we're calling Upwell Structures, if the clear links, there you go, Upwell Structures 2.0. So ever since we released Upwell Structures, they've been getting continuous improvements, new features like uh, repair and insurance, uh, quality of life improvements, uh, balance changes. And uh, the biggest of these sets of changes is coming in Q1 2018. Internally, we've been calling it a firmware update. It's going to be a big reworking of a lot of the core mechanics of upwell structures, uh, coming live to every single one of them when it releases early next year. So this set of changes has four major pillars, and I'm going to go through them now in brief. We're going to have a lot more details about them at the upwell structures presentation tomorrow, which will also be on the live stream, and then we'll have a roundtable as well for you guys to ask all your questions. And also, I'm sure you're going to ask lots of questions at the pub crawl as well. So the first of these four major pillars 
is an active and active state for structures. So the way this is going to work is that a structure is considered active if it has any service module online. All service modules consume fuel and all provide some kind of benefits to the structures. Uh, they're the kind of things that you generally want to have if you're going to be living out of a structure. And if a structure doesn't have any service modules running, then it'll be considered inactive. And active states will be connected to the defensiveness of the structure. So an inactive structure will have much lower shield and armor resistances. And it will also have no armor reinforcement cycle. It'll skip right to the hull. <laughs> And speaking of reinforcement, we're also doing a complete rework of the entire reinforcement system for Opwell structures. This system is always a challenge to design because we need to find a good balance between the interests of attackers and defenders. You need to make sure that as a defender, you have the time to uh, be able to ensure that you can actually show up to defend your structures, that it doesn't disappear while you're asleep or on vacation for a weekend. But we think that we've done a much better job with the new system of providing a good balance between the interests of the attacker and defender. Under the new system, the initial shield vulnerability of the structure will be 24-7. You'll be able to shoot at any time. <laughs> then the next fight will happen about a day, between a day and two days later, at the time chosen by the defender, so that they can make sure that that fight is in their time zone. But will be on a date chosen by the attacker, because it'll be the next day. And then the final fight will be on a both a date and a time chosen by the defender. So now there'll be one attack that can be done whenever is completely chosen by the attacker, one that is chosen on the day the attacker chooses, but the time the defender chooses, and then the final fight will be both chosen by the defender, so they can have a chance for a last stand. And the total time between when these structures first get attacked and when they can be killed, that's going to be different for different areas of space, because different areas of space have different needs. So there'll be the shortest in wormhole space, and then low sec and null sec will be in the middle, and then high sec will be the longest. We're also going to be making a big overhaul to all structure combat in this release early next year. Uh, one of the big elements of that is going to be adding supercarrier-style burst projectors to upwell structures, so they'll be able to deploy projected EWAR, which means that we'll be able to use a projected nude effect to completely replace and remove entirely the structure-guided void bomb. These burst projectors provide a lot more opportunity for mastery and skill on the, control, on the controller of the structure, as well as providing opportunities to dodge them for the defending fleet that's actually getting hit by them. Uh, so we think they're a much more interesting gameplay for both sides of the equation. We're also planning on adding the gravitational transportation field oscillator from Titans which is a very, very fun module uh, that we think is going to fit really well in some of the larger structures. This is going to come with a number of other changes as well, including a whole new set of structure fighters, so that now we can have fighters that are actually really valuable and powerful on a structure, and Tech 2 versions of structure modules, so you can upgrade. And then the, the fourth pillar of this firmware update early next year is the number one most requested thing that we've heard from you guys since we uh, announced the moon mining system in uh, FanFest of last year, and that is moon mining in W space. So the way this is going to work is you'll have moon mining in every single W space system that has moons, so not in the shattered systems. And it, you'll have moon mining in some high sec systems, the moment we're looking at 0.5 systems. These will be um, upgraded versions of standard ore, so they'll be giving normal minerals, but they'll be giving very good versions of them, uh, rather than moon goo to make sure we don't dilute the value of moon mining for uh, low sec and null sec. But yeah, we think this is going to be a really great opportunity for organized corp mining on a schedule for wormhole space for high sec people. They're going to get to participate in this gameplay as well. 
So along with those four main pillars, we're also going to be continuing to make quality of life improvements. As always, Upwell Structure is going to keep getting performance improvements. They're going to keep getting, um, if the clicker works, new features, quality of life upgrades. And we want to hear from you about what you, we should prioritize for these smaller miscellaneous things to fit in alongside. So come talk to us at the, um, come talk to us at the uh, pub crawl. Come talk to us at the round table. Talk to us in the forums. Uh, we've been really, really uh, blessed by all the feedback you guys have been giving us through things like the um, survey that we uh, launched earlier this year. And we're going to be continuing to use a lot of that information uh, as we go forward. And then after this firmware update, we still have the plan in place for the removal of uh, outposts and the introduction of new faction citadels. So because of the fact that we've, thanks to your feedback, moved this uh, new firmware update up into Q1, into the end of winter uh, 2018, 2017, 2018, we will be uh, moving the faction citadels and the outpost replacement a little bit later. So we're going to give you some more details about when that's going to happen as we get closer, but it is still coming. We are also planning to continue introducing more upwell structures, which will eventually allow us to do things like removing pauses. And we're definitely committed to continued iteration on all the core systems of upwell structures, just like we're doing with this uh, firmware update. Yeah. And all the details of these changes, these proposed changes, are going to be available in the Structures, Upwell Structures presentation tomorrow, which will also be on the stream. And we'll be talking about it with you in the roundtable as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Now I'm going to bring on CCB Berger to talk to you about, about more of what's coming in Lifeblood. Thank you. Wow. Hello, Capsuleus. <laughs> and thanks for hosting me in Las Vegas. Woof! My name is CCP Berger, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, and I'm a development manager at CCP. There is something big brewing in New Eden. And clicker. <laughs> yeah, it's huge, this thing that's brewing. And um, this year, Blood Raiders have been building up forces down south after they gained the knowledge or the know-how on how to build uh, SOTIOs, the extra large engineering com complexes. You capsuleers have managed to keep them, you know, under control, though you've also given them a chance to evolve and test out new tech. In Lifeblood, the Blood Raiders will be extending their front lines and starting setting up uh, forward operating basis in high sec. Mm. We're not entirely sure what their agenda is, but they seem to be spreading quite quickly. So we ask you guys to fleet up and help us in the effort of keeping high sec safe for all capsules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no? You sure? <laughs> Hmm, <laughs> I can trust you guys, yeah? But you know, it's also been brought to our attention, whoops, <laughs> it's also been brought to our attention that the Goristas, in true rapid fashion, have copied the Sotio blueprint and are twisting them to their own sinister needs. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Click. <laughs> Whoa, that's amazing. We, re we, <clears throat> we received this image earlier today from one of our scouts up north. Yes, we have scouts up north. And I think this is actually going to be huge. It's going to be massive. You can expect to see the Garistas follow on the Blood Raiders effort in entering HiSec come lifeblood. Again, we are not sure uh, we're not sure on their agenda. But what might be driving this search to HiSec is the recent unveiling of Empire mining expedition sites all over New Eden. For decades, each of the core empires had been mining rare resources from hidden sites to fuel the war machine. The location of these sites have now been uncovered by pirates 
who are rating the precious materials from found within. The empires need you to step up and stop the pirate threat alongside their new military logistic corps in the resource wars. <laughs> Make sure to check out CCP's affinities and CCP Vertex's uh, presentation on the resource wars tomorrow at 10, and my presentation on shipyards and the future of PVE in EVE at 11. And now, please welcome CCP Rice on the States. Hi. Uh, so, hello. It's lovely to be here. It's great to see you all. I have two quick announcements before I start my section. The first is that if you're in the audience in here, I really care about you. I think you're the best audience. But the second announcement, if you're in the social room, you get another free beer. So. All right, perfect. Let's talk about Eve. So. Um, last year, at EVE Vegas, I introduced you guys, oh, I've heard about this thing, it's special, right? I introduced you guys to this guy, this was my alpha pilot on TQ, just before we launched Clone States. And uh, I got to show you all the things I did, talk about the skill set we were going to put into Clone States, um, and spend kind of all weekend hearing feedback from you guys about what you thought the feature needed, or what was going to happen when we released it, and that was really amazing. And it's been almost a year now since the release. And since then, we've been working a lot to try and understand what's happened with clone states and figure out what our next steps are going to be. Today, I get to tell you those next steps. Um, but before I do that, let me take just a second to talk about what we've seen from clone states over the last year. Um, all in all, we're super happy. Um, the promise of Free Eve brought huge groups of new players to the game. For the first time, uh, we saw some of the biggest concurrent player counts, especially right around launch, but um, it's been really healthy for um, concurrent player counts. We have a new baseline for the number of people trying the game every day since Clone State's launch. And of course, we have lots of former players coming back at higher rates than they used to before. So we're super happy with all those things. Also, most importantly, you guys, our veterans, uh, did just a really amazing job embracing the feature. Um, you know, you advocated for it externally, like you see in these posts, people saying it's uh, really worth trying. You developed content for alphas, and of course you brought them into your organizations. And, you know, your new player support's always fantastic, and it just really showed uh, during the middle of a really big transition, so that was really great. But, um, we also learned that for a lot of players, being an alpha, still feels like an infinite trial, sort of. Um, we see this in community discussion, where people say it's a great chance to give the game a try, uh, but you know, once you like it, you need to be Omega. Um, and that bears out in our data, which shows that, uh, for the most part, people coming in, um, if they decide they like the game, they become Omega really quickly, and if they don't, they leave. Um, and of course, um, having Omegas is great, but we want the free experience to be deep enough and valuable enough that um, if you're a new player who doesn't want to subscribe, you feel like you can play for free legitimately and you don't have this kind of looming requirement to subscribe in front of you. So we want to change that. And we also want former players who are checking back in as free players to feel like they kind of can make a serious impact using powerful ships and skills they're used to using without feeling like they're just playing some little dinky character. So um, our plan to accomplish that is to add more skills. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to tell you guys uh, that coming in December, not in Lifeblood, but the next release, um, we are going to be adding a significant amount of skills to uh, the alpha state. And let me tell you about what we're planning to add. So first, um, we want to bring alphas a little closer to their omega counterparts in strength. Um, even though we're pretty happy with the power level that Alpha's got, um, there's still big gaps, especially if you compare you know, a full Omega pilot flying the same ship straight across against an Alpha pilot. Um, and so our first thing is going to be to give Tech 2 small and medium weapons to Alphas. <laughs> So not only, of course, you know, that, that's a lot of added DPS, so just plain efficacy across the board, but of course, um, it's also crucial utility from Tech2 Ammo. Now everyone has Scorch, we don't have to hear about Scorch anymore. 
Um, all right, so the next thing, um, we were guided by the dream that an important part of the Eve experience, whether you're alpha or omega, is to be able to ask the question, can I bring my Drake? <laughs> <clears throat> Now you can. Um, battle cruisers are a huge step up from cruisers, of course, and then combined with Tech 2 weapons, alphas are going to be pretty nasty now, and they should have you know, a lot better opportunities in both PvE and PvP. Now, when we were looking at battle cruisers and we're kind of stepping up, we asked ourselves, you know, why not step up even more? So we thought adding Eve's most iconic ship class was probably a good idea as well. So, battleships too. I can hear the nervousness. It's awesome. Like, this is the, the the CSM had the same exact reaction. Battle cruisers are like, yay! And the battleships are like, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, battleships are one of the most important classes in the game. They're essential to a wide range of activities, and we don't want them to be off limits for free players. Um, Based on some of that CSM nervousness, we did decide that we're going to start out by not giving Tech 2 weapons to Battleship users for, for Alpha, so they'll have Tech 1 to start, but we'll see how things develop and make adjustments later. And we have one more uh, big change for the Alpha set, which I think will make everyone pretty happy, because it's our number one request since launching it, and that is that all factions... So we had good reasons uh, for having this restriction when we launched. Ooh, you guys are getting excitable. Um, good reasons for having limitation originally, but from what we've seen since launch and uh, just from you know, talking about it and looking at what we expect, we think we're happy to let this go and just let people have all four factions on every character regardless of clone state. And of course, that does mean pirate factions um, at all sizes now, including you know, Macarials and everything else. So. <laughs> so, all said and done, alphas are going from just under 5 million skill points to just over 20 million total. Um, <laughs> So, we hope that, you know, with such a huge addition of new skills, um, we'll see a lot more players, both new ones and former ones, embracing Alpha State as a more regular, sustainable, long-term play style. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> All right, now there's another change. One other important change with this release. Characters in the alpha state are going to stop training when they reach 5 million total skill points. Okay? Training after 5 million will work normally. That is, you can subscribe for some time as an Omega, you can skill inject, whatever. And any skills you've trained uh, in the alpha set, clicker, clicker, will be available um, regardless of your account status after the skills are trained. So we're making this change because as we looked at opening up more skills for alphas, we realized that bringing along free passive training up to the new cap, like we did for the first alpha set, would eventually cause a lot of problems. Um, the more free training we gave, the less valuable skill points would become, which is not good for existing customers. It's scary for us. And inevitably, it's not good for game balance in the economy. We'd have to do a bunch of stuff with skill trading, and it was just scary. So um, with training stopped below the current extraction limit, uh, skill points will keep their value. New players can invest in them at their own pace without having to subscribe every month to con continue using alpha skills they've already trained. And of course, uh, Omega is always going to be the most rewarding way to get training time and other Omega state benefits, so that's not changing at all. Yes. Um, here's a picture of how it'll look afterwards, if this helps. New players can train at the alpha rate until they reach the total of 5 million. They spend that 5 million however they like, including all the new skills. After 5 million, they can use Omega time um, or skill trading or whatever to add uh, more skill points to their characters if they want. Any alpha skills you've used, or any alpha skills you have, 
can be used at any time regardless of clone state. So if you're a returning player, uh, you know, you trained the skills a long time ago, or you're a new alpha who just injected something specific you wanted, like you grab Battlecruiser only, um, you can use it indefinitely once it's in your head. And then skills outside the alpha set will still require Omega status to train and use like they always have. On top of everything here, um, because of the added flexibility in this space under 20 million, we are looking at new ways to sell training time in smaller chunks than 30 days so that you can kind of do it in a more flexible way, but I don't have details on that yet, so you'll get those soon. And that's it for me. I can't wait to talk to you guys about this this weekend. We have a round table uh, on Sunday at 3. Please come and let me know what you think. And uh, can't wait to see how this all goes. And with <laughs> Thanks. And with that, I'm going to give you back to CCP Falcon. Have fun, guys. Yay, the clicker works. Great. So what do you guys think? You like it? So we've been pretty surprised by how well... Nah, that ain't happening. <laughs> so we've been pretty surprised by how well so many pilots have adapted to flying as an alpha. From new players to veterans who've returned, seems like quite a few pilots have relished the opportunity to revisit New Eden and just to come back for some quick fun. We can't wait to see what you guys come up with in terms of new fleet doctrines and new approaches to harnessing the newfound power of alpha pilots when December comes. It's going to be fantastic. Myself, my alpha actually hit the skill point limit not so long ago, uh, so I can't wait to get him out of his thorax and into a Talos or maybe a Blaster Throne. I haven't really decided yet. It's going to be something close range that punches people in the face though. That's, that's kind of my jam, definitely. Um, also on that note, speaking of Galente ships, because I've got the clicker during the keynote for once and I can, I'm going to do this. Galente pilots, best pilots. All of the ships and pilots are inferior. Especially if you're Kaldari. Eh, Min Matar's okay. No, okay, back to CBU stuff. So, we've been watching carefully to see how the community's been using the alpha skill set. And we're super excited to see what you guys do with the tactical options that are going to open up in December. We really feel it's going to provide you guys with more options, flexibility, and emerging content to sink your teeth into. And it's going to be really fun to see what actually happens to the PvP meta when these skills become available to alpha pilots with the December release. It's just going to be insane. While the lifeblood expansion focuses on some far-reaching areas of Nullsec industry. It's also kind of a long-running industrial revolution for New Eden. The alpha changes coming afterward are part of another commitment that we have. We also want to continue to make sure that EVE Online gets more and more accessible in the future, so that awesome emergent experiences and images like these ones right here become even more frequent in New Eden. These are actually all on the wall in the, in the, uh, the community team's office over at CCP headquarters right now, after I put a forum thread up looking for images. Now, so, I think we can all agree that at some point in the past, most pilots have experienced that whole two-hour roam for 90 seconds of screaming adrenaline fuel combat. You've all had that, right? You know? And you know, it usually, it usually ends up before you either scream in victory or you wake up in a vat full of goo with a headache and a really shitty insurance bill. So um, it's never fun. We want you guys to be able to choose to play for shorter and more frequent play sessions if you want to. In short, we want you, Eden, to be more flexible for you guys so that you can dive in and have fun whenever you want. And yeah, we want it to be more fun. This is wonderful. <laughs> and special thanks to FaceApp for making sure that I'm actually never going to sleep again, because this is super <laughs> creepy. I have never seen the Mitanni smile before, so yeah, it's a new one for me. So many of the features and changes in Lifeblood have this goal in mind. And here at e Vegas, you're going to hear about a few of them over the coming days. You're going to hear about new developments for the agency, which is going to allow you to find content faster and easier, regardless of your interest in game. You're going to hear about resource wars which uh, CZB Burgers covered a little bit. Uh, it's going to bring some really, really good content to high sec. And of course, the mining ledger as well, so you can track your own efficiency when you're harvesting, alongside the efficiency of your wingmen and your court mates. It's got a little bit of competition going on. My click. <sighs> that said, the drive for more accessibility and fun doesn't just focus on alpha pilots or a single area of space. This touches the whole of New Eden. All of that right up there. We've been speaking with CSM12 a lot this year, and they've been fantastic help with really in community concerns and engaging with us on the issues that our veteran community feel are most important. 
A few of these have included PvP violence, issues with structure timers, and issues with structures combat. As you've seen from what CCP Fuzzy presented, we've started work on this. And we're going to be collaborating closely with both the CSM and you guys, the wider community, over the coming months to look at addressing these concerns. Because there's nothing more we want to see than you guys fueling the fire of conflict in New Eden. And we want to make sure that the stories you continue to write can be more epic than ever before. As we celebrate the 15th anniversary of EVE Online in 2018, we want to push towards the third decade with the goal of putting more power to create and destroy in the hands of the community. We're listening to you guys. Your voices are being heard. The CSM are hardcore advocating for you at every step of the way. And once Lifeblood is with us, you can be sure that we're going to be moving to address as many of the concerns that you guys have with what you would call end game gameplay as possible. While we're talking about structures, let's also talk a little bit about Lifeblood in general. There's a lot more going to it than just these big fellas. So we've got refineries, of course. And um, we hope you guys have seen some good stuff today and over the course of the last few months. And we hope you guys are pretty stoked about deploying these things. You guys looking forward to it, yeah? yeah. This is good. Makes me happy. <laughs> so we've got new mining, new mining mechanics coming as well. And a complete redistribution of new minerals. To supplement these changes, you guys are also going to get improved reactions that are uh, now in the home in the industry UI. My slide, oh, this clicker, jeez. And as CCB Nagel explained earlier, both these features are going to be exclusive to refineries with the release of Lifeblood. So it's going to be good. And then, of course, we also have re our resource wars. You're going to hear more about this in a dedicated pre presentation tomorrow morning from CCP Affinity uh, and CCP Vertex. For those of you guys watching at home, there's also going to be a player session tomorrow that will show off some of Resource Wars features. This is going to air right here on the EVE Vegas live stream at 1 p.m. PDT or 8 p.m. UTC if you're operating on EVE time. So be sure to tune in for that and take a look. Also coming with Lifeblood, we've got the pirate oper forward operating bases that CCP Burger was just talking about uh, from the Garistas Pirates and the Blood Raider Covenant. You should join CCP Burger tomorrow at 11 in this room for the Shipyards and Future PVE presentation. We're going to take a real close look at it. And of course, you guys might have already seen a dev blog that's out there. In preparation for the uh, expansion of the alpha skill set in December, we'll also have an alpha ship balance pass coming with Lifeblood as well. There's already details out there in dev blogs uh, and news posts about the changes that are coming. So go take a look at the community portal and, uh, and see how you guys like it. In Lifeblood, we've also got improvements to the agency. The session finder's coming displaying a real-time list of activities you can get involved in. You should check out the presentation from CCP Puncturus and CCP Shark at 11 a.m. on Sunday for this as well. In addition to this, we've also got the mining ledgers coming. So all in all, it makes for a pretty cool package. We're super excited to, deli excited to deliver all this stuff to you on, uh, on October 24th. And we hope that you guys are going to have fun with them over the winter as we prepare for more stuff and up well structures 2.0 in earlier 2018. You guys liking how Lifeblood's looking so far? It's good? <laughs> In addition to this, however, there's a little bit extra that we're going to throw in. Garista Shipyards. Uh, we were going to release these a little bit later, but they're coming out with lifeblood, basically. So those of you up north who were laughing at the Imperium losing ships to the Blood Raiders in Delve, suck it up, because it's your turn now. <laughs> and what shipyard would be complete without its own line of new hulls? The Cayman-class Dreadnought, the Loggerhead class Force Auxiliary, and the Komodo-class Titan are all coming with Lifeblood on October 24th. And you're going to hear a lot more about these tomorrow in the shipyards and future PVE presentation. You might find also that these shipyards are going to be a little different from the ones in Delve because the Garistas run the show a little bit different up north to how the Blood Raiders do in Delve. Another hull, oh, I love this part. Another hull that will be released with Lifeblood is one that we've learned a lot about this year. The Marshal. And holy crap, did we learn a lesson for this one. Just to put it out there, I want to confirm, to avoid market speculation and any craziness, that everyone who came to FanFest and Vegas 2017 will get one of these. <laughs> one. Count the fingers. Those eligible to receive the ship should keep an eye out for communication from CCP during November, and you're going to get a single-use code to redeem this via account management. Don't despair, though. If you weren't able to make it to both events, the Marshal is going to be available in the first half of 2018 in the same manner as a pacifier and enforcer as a reward for progress and project discovery. So you guys will be able to get your hands on it if you weren't at both events. It's just going to take a little bit more time and a little bit of elbow grease too. 
So over the course of the next couple of days, all these changes are going to be reflected on EVE updates. And as we move forward with the release of more features and changes in 2018 and beyond, EVE updates is going to be the one-stop location for all the latest information on new content and changes coming to New Eden. Keep an eye on the website. We'll be updating. I might update it tonight. Depends on how drunk you get at the pub crawl. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. But it's going to be there. In addition to the release of Lifeblood on October 24th and the alpha changes coming in December, there's also a number of events planned over the holiday season and into 2018. So we're obviously going to have the Crimson Harvest again. And then we're going to have an event that's more focused on the newfound power of alphas, let's say. Then, of course, we'll have the Yule Festival too, the Guardians Gala, and, of course, for the uh, 15th anniversary, we're going to have Capture Leader Day again. So you guys can look forward to that. The art and graphics team are pretty hard at work putting together some pretty cool stuff to celebrate all these events, and most of it's still work in progress. However, I did kind of read the internal wiki at work and steal some pictures of some stuff that's coming for the Crimson Harvest. So uh, say hello to the Oracle Headhunter. And why not say hello to the Magnate too? But this year, it's not just the Mar pilots that get to have fun. Here's the Caracal. And the Tristan. And the Typhoon. This year, every faction gets to look good and wear these colors. And these are just a handful of the skins on offer. You're going to be able to get hold of some of these as loot drops from uh, agency sites. And some are also going to be in the new Eden store. So there's going to be a mix of ways to get a hold of them. You should also check out the Art of Eve presentation at 2 PM on Sunday, where CCB Blue Screen is going to be showing more cool stuff the audio and graphics team have been working on. With all this coming over the next few months, starting October, plus some essential quality of life changes for those living in the far reaches of space in early 2018, we're pretty excited to see where we're headed as we move towards the 15th anniversary. It's going to be pretty cool. Before we head out in the pub crawl, we have one more session tonight. And we're happy to announce, you've probably seen him around, that for the first time after a short break at the end of the keynote, we're going to have a CEO, Hilmar, in Vegas for the first time with us here this year. And he's going to give an update on what's going on at CCP, as well as maybe a few little extra bits of information here and there on some other stuff. So with that, let's take a short break before we welcome Hilmar on stage. And to close out the keynote, let's kill the lights, because we've prepared a little bit of a montage to run through what's coming with Lifeblood. And I'll get the clicker right in a second. You guys like it? Yeah. See it again? Yeah? I gotta get my clicker working. All right, here we go.